Hi, I'm Alistair. In my last two videos, I described some of the different sorts of programmable LED strips you can buy, and also how to wire them to an ESP or Arduino microcontroller. Now, in this video, I want to describe some of the practical problems you might encounter with an LED installation, such as this one, including issues like power and cabling. So here I've got 8 meters of WS2812B LED strips which I've mounted onto these wooden battens and then attached to the ceiling. And that would be my first tip I guess, if you're considering mounting LEDs in any kind of hard to access place, put them onto some kind of frame that means that you can assemble them and test them easily rather than trying to do all that working above your head height all the time which is going to get awkward really quickly. Now, strips like this are normally sold in metre-long sections. So if you buy 8 metres of LEDs, you won't get a single continuous 8 metre strip. What you'll get is a reel containing 8 1 metre strips. And these will have these JST SM connectors at the end of them, which means that they're easy to connect together in metre-long sections. And you'll see that I've got those connectors running down the middle here. Now, you might think that that's a little bit annoying, but actually it's a good thing because the fact that you get these breaks in the cable every meter means that it's easy to inject power at regular intervals along the strip. So, what do I mean by that? Well, first let me show you a clearer illustration of how I've got these wired together so you don't have to put up with my shaky camera work. I've got 8 metres of strips with LEDs spaced at 30 LEDs per metre, so that's a total of 240 LEDs. Now that's easily within the capability of an ESP32 to control from a single GPIO pin, and because the ESP32 is positioned about 3 or 4 metres away from the first LED, I'm using a MAX485 transceiver to transmit the data signal from that GPIO pin down a twisted wire pair, and then another MAX485 to decode it at the other end near the LED strip. Now from that point onwards, the signal is retransmitted from each LED to the next down the strip. And I explained more details about that in my last video. But now I'm concerned not about the level or quality of the data signal, I'm looking at the actual power that the LEDs require to light up. Now, if you were to have every LED in this strip turn on at full brightness, that would require about 60 milliamps per LED, so with 240 LEDs, that's a little under 15 amps. Now, I'm using a 20 amp, 5 volt power supply, which is 100 watts, and when choosing a power supply, you always need the correct voltage, and at least as many amps as your system is likely to draw. Now it doesn't matter if it's capable of supplying slightly more power than you require because the LEDs will only draw as much as they need. But you don't want to use a supply that's significantly more than you need since that introduces some uh, safety implications which I'll come to in a bit. So the easiest way to connect this power supply is simply to wire it into ground and to 5 volts at the beginning of the strip. But there's two problems with this and they're both kind of related. The first is that the voltage gradually drops the further away from the power supply. So the LEDs at the far end of the strip can receive less than the minimum voltage they need and that's going to cause them to be dimmer, to flicker or perhaps display the wrong colour. And the second problem is that the current required by all the LEDs has to flow through the strip and it's only got very thin copper traces on it, and that can only really handle about 4 amps, maybe 5 amps, any greater than that, and these strips are going to get very hot, possibly reducing their lifespan, causing damage to the strip, or in the very worst case, be a fire hazard. Now, the solution to both of these issues is to not have a single voltage supply provide for all the LEDs, but rather inject power at multiple points along the strip. This will maintain a more consistent voltage along the entire strip length and also split the current load, reducing the strain on any one part of the strip. So we can take this same power source we're using here and run additional wires from it to the end of the strip, say. Now these wires can be nice and chunky, uh, 18 AWG say, which reduces their resistance and ensures that there's not much voltage lost uh, across this distance here. And you can do this at as many points along the strip as you want. 
Now I mentioned that these strips are sold in one meter length sections often and there are two additional power wires provided at the end of each section. So you can inject power every meter if you want, or you can do it less frequently. It will depend on factors such as the LED density and the operating voltage. I'm doing it every two meters here, but there's a very useful calculator available online that will tell you the uh, correct number of injection points you need and models the voltage drop at different points along the strip. Now, if you're powering a lot of LEDs, you might find that only one power supply is not sufficient, or perhaps it might just be more convenient to use a secondary power supply rather than running wires from one. And that's fine, you can use different power supplies at different sections of the strip. If you do that, you should ensure that you don't connect the red voltage line between them. So even if you have two power supplies that both claim to be five volts, they're not going to give out exactly the same voltage, so you don't want to connect them together. Instead, just keep their grounds wired together and then effectively have them as two different powered circuits in different sections of the strip. And again, you can repeat that with as many different power supplies as you want. Now, the last thing I want to mention is about fuses and safety. I said earlier that you don't want to use a power supply that's significantly overpowered for your needs, because let's say there's a short circuit at some point in the, the strip or two trailing wires touch at the end, that's gonna cause your power supply to deliver its full supply down the strip. That could be many, many amps, which could give you a nasty electric shock. So use a power supply that's sufficient, but not excessive. And the other thing I'd recommend you do is to install a fuse into the positive voltage from that power supply. Now, obviously you should already have a fuse in the plug at the mains AC end anyway, but you can also get these nice inline fuse holders that you can simply uh, place into the DC power supply lines. So what you want to do is to choose a fuse that is slightly higher than the maximum current you expect your strip to draw under normal usage. And then if for any reason something occurs in the circuit, a short circuit that causes it to suddenly demand more than that, it's going to blow the fuse. Now, hopefully this will protect your circuit but even if it fails to do that, what it will do is protect it from starting a fire, um, which is going to be significantly more important.